Okay, good morning everybody. Um, so I am uh, probably one of the rare uh, accountants here. I, I see my colleagues who are very supportive of me, but in the domain of uh, sustainability and social responsibility, accounting is not, uh, I mean, we are not uh, the, the major discipline that you think about. My research is um, based on reporting practices of company. And in this paper, uh, we are trying to apply the model of organized hypocrisy based on a uh, piece of legislation in the US. I always like to start presentation with a, a quote. I don't know if you know um, uh, Groucho Marx. The secret, <laughs> the secret to success is honesty and fair dealing. And he said, if you can fake those, you've got it made. Okay? And that was quoted in uh, what we're going to base our paper on uh, Niels Brunson's um, hypocrisy f framework. And uh, you, you can relate to that as we go to the paper. So I'll I won't uh, deal more with that. I was wondering if any of you have seen any of these things before. And I think if you're in, the, in this room, in this conference, you may have. Those are what we call uh, the standalone so social responsibility reports. And they have different names. You can have sustainability report, because the Halliburton report here. You can have a citizenship report, like Exxon has here. And you can have some advertising, like Air France here has the most sustainable flights, and they are basically reports that are dedicated to expose and present the social and environmental actions and performance and operations, the impacts they have on society. Some reports are very uh, short, detailed. Uh, they, have, they, are, they are varying in nature. So just a, a quick introduction, background on, on the area of sustainable reporting is that more and more companies are going to issue those type of reports in addition to the annual reports. We used to have sections of the annual reports dealing with uh, social and environmental issues. That turned out to be now the, those standalone reports as I showed you. As of 2008, that is kind of older survey now, but uh, the most global companies in the world, most multinational companies do have um, uh, those reports out. Okay? And the biggest uh, feature of that report, and I would say now more an issue, is that the, the choice of issuing this report is purely voluntary. There's no mandated regulation on that. And it's also uh, non-regulated as well. The question we ask is, some companies and more companies today are than not. Why organizations are engaging in this type of reporting if they don't have to do it and if it's non-regulated? Okay. Um, there are two sides of it. Okay. Unimon et al. 2007 in their uh, introduction to the book Sustainable Accounting and Accountability said that on the positive side, these type of reporting practices are kind of similar to what we had for accounting and accountability, meaning it's a tool for management, planning, and control. And in that sense, that could be uh, useful to address the impacts of social and environmental actions of the company. Okay? So rather a positive and optimistic view of that. On the other hand, the negative side is that critics of this type of reporting, see that it is nothing more than public relations and it is just used to maintain and satisfy the demands of the stakeholders. So there are two sides of it. And you can see just by the title I'm going to talk to you about where we stand. But there are some, of course, some proponents of this reporting who, are, who, are, who believe in that, in that positive side. And actually, I think when it was first implemented, uh, that was the purpose. And it turned out to be a thing it has evolved. So why are we motivated in this study? Well, first, we want to explore in more in depth uh, the reporting uh, motivation of companies. It's also this special section in the Journal of Accounting Organization Society by uh, Anthony Hopwood, who has passed away a few years ago. But he has left this um, call for research that we should continue to explore this type of uh, motive implicated in why companies are producing these reports, get a deeper understanding of this process, and getting uh, in touch and with the media, the authorities, and the political circles. Okay, so different types of actors. And we also would like to introduce here our uh, model of hypocrisy from Brunson in this literature, which has not been uh, done in the same way as uh, it could have. So this is kind of why, why we are here. All right, this is a quote from Niels Brunson. Okay, I think it's a very simple way to, the way he defines hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a way of handling situations when what is said cannot be done, and what is done cannot be talked about. Okay? 
Hypocrisy means that we continue to talk about things that can be talk about, talked about and do things that can be done. What can be said is not limited by what can be done and vice versa. I know it's maybe confusing, but you, you will see that from that talk and actions, we, 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 you know, I'm going to get to that uh, a more structured framework. Okay? So the purpose here is to advance this reporting research um, on sustainability by applying this model of organized hypocrisy. And these three words here, you're going to see them a lot in this presentation and we use the paper, is we examine the talk, the decisions, and the actions of the big oil firms. Basically, we take uh, seven very large corporations in the U.S., in the oil and gas industry, and we see how, through talk, decision, and actions, they are attempting to strategically manage stakeholder conflicts and demands for profit and environmental stewardship. So here I'm, I, I don't spend too much time because this is a very brief overview of the, the theories I've been using in social accounting or social reporting are coming from the social political background, legitimacy and stakeholder. And a lot of literature today or even you know, 10, 15 years ago can have said, okay, we should not treat them, uh, treat those two theories as separate they are considered as commensurate. The, the differences lies in the level of analysis, legitimacy theory, looking at society as a uniform, one-piece actor with a single contract between uh, society and businesses. Um, and legitimacy wants to examine whether the social norms are, are, are followed, okay? How, how the norms of the company or the business are congruent to the general norms of society. On the other hand, Stakeholder theory focuses more on the relationships they have uh, with the organizations vis-a-vis uh, -vis their other stakeholders. And of course, stakeholder theory acknowledges there are different types of stakeholder, different stakeholder power, so different influence. And of course, these expectations will result in conflicts. Okay? So the ability to maintain this legitimacy among this relationship between various stakeholders and the organization is depending on how well we are managing and balancing those conflicts. How do we apply that in the hypocrisy? Hypocrisy as a legitimacy strategy, saying that sometimes in the, by doing that, you will definitely have internal incons inconsistency. And when you have this conflicting demand, that's what Brunson's call and says, this is what, how we get organized hypocrisy, because there are going to be some trade-offs to do, and there's going to be some unbalancing. Okay, so this is how Brunson put it when he talks about hypocrisy with the three words, talk, decision, and actions. So response to a world which values ideas, people or are in conflict, and it's a way of, in which individuals and organizations handle such conflicts, a way of handling conflicts by reflecting them in inconsistencies here among talk, decision, and actions. So the talk, decision, and actions, and the unbalancing and the inconsistency among them will lead to hypocrisy. Um, how, how can, for, as an example, how can an organization now continually keep being hypocrite, hypocrite and maintain legitimacy standing within the organization? Well, this is called a politicization. The company can develop multiple substructures, so it can kind of divide up some of the stakeholder conflict interest so that they are become more independent and one, for example, having an affirmative action office is not going to resolve the employment practice issue of the company. Uh, when they are in independent, they are separated and isolated, there's a lower chance to be discovered or questioned and this is how um, they, they're going to start orchestrating this. Okay? How are we going to balance the talk, decision, and action? Let's focus more on that so that the other type of subgroup will not be in conflict with the other, will not find out, or will be less visible. Talk decisions are the three dominant outputs, as I said, and the organized hypocrisy are coupled differently. It means that decision and action are reversely, in, in, um, talk decision and action are reversely uh, related. Talk decision in one direction decreases the likelihood of actions, and action in one direction decreases in the talking decisions. So, He's basically saying, make a choice of uh, where do we focus on, the talking decision or the actions. They are not coupled in a, a, a way. And what uh, Lipson says is that it's more counter-coupling. 
we are looking at docking decisions are com compensating for inconsistent action and vice versa. Okay. We the, the best ways that companies can do, at least for talk and even decisions, are through various communication strategy. I won't go into detail on that, but it is basically the effective use of rhetorics and, and languages and disclosure strategy. And that will um, uh, lead to different type of decision and uh, possible of the decision because the decision itself could be equivocal, okay? It could be subject to many interpretations. So this is kind of the framework we're in, okay? We're trying to apply this model. Now, we chose this Arctic National Wild Refuge case. This is in Alaska in the US. It's an area that is uh, very well protected uh, by legislation. It's uh, a still an unexplored area. And in the US, uh, there was a subject to uh, discussion because there is oil in there, okay? There is oil underneath. And of course, it is uh, subject to interest of a lot of oil companies. Uh, there's an area called the 1002 area. I have no idea why they call it that, but that's that specific region where there is a lot abundance of oil uh, hydrocarbon exploration could be a very profitable activity. And the question is to drill or not to drill. Uh, there's a big debate going on that. And the, insert, the, the argument of uh, drill or not to drill is that the one who were um, saying, well, we're not sure that they are actually oil resources. So they were making that argument to prevent that versus, of course, the creation of jobs Okay, that's always a justification to expand businesses, particularly in the U.S. context. So the Alaskan uh, native have also their say. Uh, there's two kinds of um, inhabitants here. Uh, one group of Eskimos from the U.S. side support the drilling because it's good for economic reasons and for themselves. And on the other side, the Gwich'in Indians in Canada are strongly uh, opposed because of natural resources constraints. And overall, we can still say that even though there are some uh, disagreement, they ultimately have concerns that their human rights and their culture uh, may not be respected. So uh, there is some kind of consensus and there are some, just some, some variations on that. So I'm going to like detail on that, but just to give you a timeline, since the 1960s to today, it has been that area, the Anwar, what we call the Anwar, has been a protected area under President Eisenhower in the 1960s, and then it's been reinforced by some legislation, etc. And now, 2005 and 6 recently has come a debate on that. And the period 2005 and 6 is kind of a zoom out on that, has been House of Representatives versus Senators in the U.S. fighting each other for uh, a vote. Okay, the vote has been 2025 to 2001 win, but then it has been uh, blocked at the House level again. So it's been going back and forth to date. It is still protected, okay? But you can, there was a lot of heated political debate and activities during that period. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Um, we decided to do, um, saying that under Brunson's model, we are making the argument that the largest visible firms that talk the most about sustainability under the hypocrisy model are expected to take the most unsustainable actions. And empirically speaking, then we're going to qualitatively analyze the reports, all right, and contrast them with an analysis using quantitative uh, um, data of corporate political activities and co see, uh, compare the talk decisions and the actions of the company. So just to give you an idea uh, very briefly, these are the firms that we are focusing on. Okay, they represent about 75% of the market share of oil and gas in the US. And you can see that already the, contrib the political contributions they made are very biased towards a certain party. And that's kind of the amount. Okay, the amounts are minimum compared to what, of course, the profits are. Pack contributions are limited in amounts. They are more used as a symbolic uh, actions to contribute to uh, legislators. So um, the method we use is that we, we took uh, three years of reports, 2003 to 2005, and all of the um, companies have operations in Alaska except for one, and we're gonna make a qualitative analysis of the disclosure on the reports using uh, the software Atlas TI and y using visual, visual mapping coding and getting quoted uh, quotes under the three themes, environment protection, human rights, and indigenous people for the local 
uh, inhabitants and the political strategy. So there's a series of quotes, I, you know, I cannot read all of them to you because I don't have time, but basically the ba one of the, the biggest theme is environmental protection, whether it's in the past, in the present, or the future. Okay, you can see some quotes from Exxon here that they are committed to operate responsibly everywhere. Uh, Coke, uh, Coke company um, is like protect, we're gonna manage operations in a manner that uh, protect the environment, health and safety and, and employees, etc. Also have biodiversity protection. So specifically to the biodiversity of what they're doing here, uh, the impact of all people. Uh, there's one company here, ConocoPhillips, only one out of the 20 reports that specifically mentioned the Alaska area. The rest did not really um, mention anything that they're, they intend to or they, they have operations in the Alaska. Um, in terms of human rights, they have uh, another commitment rule. So after protection is like we are being careful and respecting human rights policies. And of course, now they also defining scope that also governments are responsible. So they still kind of do the blame shifting here and say, look, uh, government is responsible to protect human rights and w what we're doing uh, basically is bonus, right? So um, here is a quote from Exxon. All right, and a few more quotes on indigenous people um, and looking at communities uh, needs and only one on specifically Alaska uh, natives Okay, on the Alaska North Slope, the company employs subsistence representative and village liaison to promote clear and open communication on that. And finally, uh, very limited, but they do talk about, they are very transparent at least on saying, we are making political uh, contributions for, you know, to, to support our, our business uh, interest, uh, but they don't really say, uh, you know, to, for what specific, uh, except for here. And they also have this, I always find it interesting when on a sustainable report they're talking about strengthening the free enterprise system. So that's, to me, that was a huge inconsistency on why do you put that in a sustainable report? But that was uh, excellent 2005. Okay. Now, we did some complementary analysis. Okay. Some reviewers came back to us and said, well, you need to go beyond just the reports. And we did corporate website disclosure, historical uh, archive website, and advertising. In general, we find similar patterns of the disclosure. There's a, the, those recurring themes that come back uh, the same as sustainable reports. Political activities. The question is, because we have the data available for saying these firms are making contributions, very targeted, carefully thought contributions to legislators of US Congress. And there's a, a literature on, on the lobbying uh, model. And the question is, do members of these committee uh, on natural resources, because that's the one that decides on the legislation, receive higher amount, political amount, than the one who are not on the committees, their counterparts. So we analyze the House of Representatives because this is where the bill was kind of drafted. And so we must have the party and we must have the um, environmental record uh, control um, variable. Um, and, okay, I'll go through that, but these are variable PAC contributions, we can get that from oh, the Center for Responsive Politics, membership, whether they're a member or not, legislator ideology, and political party. Okay, and the nice thing about doing research political in the US is that there's only two parties. Okay, so you see the Democrats or Republican, unlike uh, in different countries where you have several parties. And so some briefly statistics. Um, okay, there were um, 170 uh, Democrats that voted against the bill versus 30, uh, there were 59 members uh, in the committee, um, and uh, 367. And on average, uh, per, per um, committee member or non-committee member, uh, committee member received significantly higher amount on average. You can see the total here, um, but even with the total, you can see that the amount becomes um, significantly different when you come down to per, per contribution member. Um, on the other hand, we're looking at the, the party here instead of the vote. So the Democrats are uh, getting 21 votes against and uh, 6, 4, and 30, etc. And here it's even more flagrant that the, the Republicans are clearly getting a much higher number, much higher dollar amount than their Democrat uh, colleagues. In terms of the vote, 
Now it's even more flagrant now. Uh, those who voted for are receiving uh, almost 15 to 17 times more money. Okay, if you look at the, 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 the gross amount here, there's, no, there's not even a discussion. Of course, it was targeted to have this law passed. They targeted specific people sitting on the committee and who are going to vote to the passage of that law. So to complement the analysis, we, we run this uh, Tobit model, which is a quantitative model of political contribution. The dependent variable being the amount of dollar contributions and the test variable being the membership. And clearly, um, a controlling, controlling for party and, and uh, ideology. And the results uh, confirm what we found in the descriptive and the t-test we, we, we ran, that there is significantly high correlation, highly significantly correlated between being a member of the committee resource committee and uh, natural resource committee and uh, the, the amount of dollar amount you're going to uh, uh, receive. There are some limitations of that study, of course, getting to, to the end, that we have only investigated reporting practices of one industry, the oil and gas, over a restricted time period. So uh, how we can generalize that, um, we cannot determine. We also have to know that PAC contributions, political action committee contributions, are not the only drive, driver behind corporate political strategy. Um, they gain, help gain access, it's a symbolic factor, but there are other things like lobbying expenditures that allow um, uh, influence of politics in the outcome of the bill. Okay? In conclusion, okay, we have sought to contrast this discourse of very large companies to what they do behind the back. Okay? So the discourse is to protect diversity, to protect the environment, but yet on the action side, Okay, uh, they, they're going to lobby for, for that law. So there are evidence of inconsistency between the talking decisions and the actions. And then here, we believe that it has kind of fit the model of, of uh, Brunson, that's what we're hoping to do, and to convince uh, you and the reviewers that uh, firms are, are, are taking hypocritical actions and actually being successful. And finally, Okay, we're going to benefit from that, but I'm going to end with the, I started with a quote, I'm going to end with a quote from Brunson. Um, I really found it uh, original. But hypocrisy can be seen as a tribute that pays vice, that vice pays to virtue. Okay, so he explains that hypocrisy can t talk about in these decisions. The example here is striking. Hypocrisy makes it possible for a company with a polluting production and product. So he takes the example of a car producer establish environmental plans and decide to go about these goals. If you didn't have hypocrisy, you would say we are having operations that pollute, uh, that we plan to continue these operations, and we're going to defend uh, them as being necessary and unavoidable. Okay? In that case, he argued that many people would probably think that the company polluted not only the physical environment, but the moral environment as well. In some sense, he's coming back and saying, it's almost practically necessary to be hypocrite for companies. Okay, the, the, the problem is is lying there. So we are we are getting in a circle, and I just want to leave with that my presentation. Thank you. <laughs>